wonderful to be with all of you. My name is Bill McGarvey. I work with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. This is our third uh, Wink Fellow book club. Uh, it's been great to, pe to see so many people keep showing up and thank you for all of your interest and your emails and uh, comments uh, between sessions. It's been really wonderful to be here. Tonight we're going to be doing chapters four and five and I think most folks should have gotten the Zoom reminder with the with all the the content and the questions and prompts and, and quotes that, that Fernando wants to cover tonight. Um, if you didn't, please let just let us know and we'll try to, I can put them into the chat right here. Um, we're in a, like I said, Am, uh, Fernando is calling in from Amsterdam where it is currently one in the morning, one Oh four in the morning. So he's, he, he's going way above and beyond the call because he's in Amsterdam for the next few months. Uh, so we appreciate that for his time and uh, I appreciate your taking the time. I wanna just, if I can just mention a few little advertisements that I promised uh, uh, some folks that I'd make about the, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. We have a new MLK curriculum guide. As many of you know, the Fellowship of Reconciliation very famously printed the very famous MLK, uh, Martin Luther King, um, the Montgomery Bus Boycott comic book in the late fifties. It's become legendary and iconic. And we recently uh, got one of our consultants, Sarah uh, from Ohio, Sarah DeBolt, uh, uh, to do a, she's a great educator, to do a curriculum guide. And so when you go on our web webpage, we, we encourage you to check out the MLK uh, resource under, under resources, uh, the curriculum guide. It's really great. We have schools around the country who are using graphic novels and graphic, graphic books. Uh, teachers around the country use that for different age groups. And we've gotten some great response to it, but we're really trying to get the word out. So I'll please, I'll put the link into the chat here in a second. I just did, Bill. Oh, you did? Thanks, Anthony. So you'll see it right there. The Montgomery Story Curriculum Guide. Uh, it's wonderful. And I believe, um, Ethan, you can speak to this. I believe we now have another, there's another added uh, bit on there uh, that, uh, that, that Sarah did for us as well. Is that the case? We have a brand new um, resource that was just released yesterday that I'm delighted to mention. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, sure. Um, and again, great to be with everyone uh, this evening, June, to see you, Fernando, in the middle of the night. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and everyone. Um, it just released yesterday, um, uh, Continuing to Break the Silence, uh, Learnings and Reflections on Vietnam, Palestine, and Beyond. And what this uh, resource is, um, again, it's another just free download from our website. Again, um, the, the same colleague of ours, Sarah debolt Badawi, who Bill just mentioned, um, who's an educator and uh, curricula writer and all that. And this one um, engages, uh, as we are on the verge of this coming Monday, um, the anniversary of Martin Luther King's 55-year anniversary of um, his speech, Break Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence, uh, that Thanks. prophetic sermon that he delivered at the Riverside Church in 1967 that many of you know and have worked with and have shared and drawn upon, and I'm sure it was really informative for Walter's work. Um, uh, it takes that text, um, that extraordinary text, and it puts it in conversation with a New York Times op-ed written by Michelle Alexander, who, again, many of you who have drawn oh. on her work uh, on the new Jim Crow, that she wrote uh, Time to Break the Silence on Palestine three years ago in the New York Times and, and engages the two of them together. So um, uh, Anthony has put the, the link right into the chat for all of you uh, who want to draw upon that. It's a, you can just learn a little bit of a snippet about it and then just grab it as a PDF download from there and think of using it in your own life, in your community, in your congregation. However, that's uh, useful. But uh, as April 4th approaches, we wanted to put this out there and, and hope it's going to be really meaningful to everyone. So with that, I'd ask uh, Dr. Ona to, to maybe join us, start us with prayer and then start the, and start the book club. Welcome back, everyone. It is wonderful to see each and every one of you, um, wherever you are. I've also placed in the chat the quotes that were posted um, that we will be um, engaging with uh, today. Um, but before we begin, I do wanna um, sort of invite us into a space of prayer. And because it is the start of Ramadan tomorrow, we are going to pray Muslim prayers for peace this evening as a start. 
Um, so in the name of Allah, the beneficent and the merciful, praise be to the Lord of the universe who has created us and made us into tribes and nations that we may know each other, not that we may despise each other. If the enemy incline towards peace, do thou also incline towards peace and trust in God for the Lord is one that heareth and knoweth all things, and the servants of God, most gracious are those who walk on the earth in humility, and when we address them, we say peace. The messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O oh God, you are peace. From you comes peace. To you returns peace. Revive us with a salutation of peace and lead us to your abode of peace. Amen. So welcome everyone again. Um, and today we are going to navigate through two chapters that are really what I consider one of the most challenging chapters in this book. Um, and I deeply love these two chapters, but the lessons that Dr. Wink raises um, are really tough lessons and, 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 and tough strategies, especially in the times that we're in. Um, and I wanna lift up the fact that, you know, we are witnessing this Ukrainian war that Russia has been waging. Um, and we continue to witness other conflicts and violence throughout the world as well as experiences the violence of human-made climate change impacts on, on not only human populations, but our ecosystems. And so one of the things that I wanted to raise um, just for our group discussions, and so I'm gonna talk less today um, based on the feedback that everyone had and really just pose some questions for our breakout sessions that we will do for about 40 minutes. And then we're gonna come back into the larger plenary for about 40, 45 minutes so that we have a lot, a lot more time to engage with each other um, and, and sort of get into the thick of what Dr. Wink um, sort of invites us into the space of nonviolence. I want to, you can read the quotes, but I want to invite us to really critically think about three major things that Wink helps us reread in, in, in the sacred scripture of, of the Christian tradition. You know, what does Wink mean when he, when he reads and interprets uh, Jesus' stance around turning the other cheek? That's on page 101. What does Wink also mean about and engage with stripping naked and as a tactic, a nonviolent tactic? And then that's on page 105. And then finally, how do we engage with Dr. Wink around this, this notion of going the second mile um, or going the extra mile um, on page 107? All three of these remind us um, of how Dr. Wink also lifts up uh, the New Testament epistle um, in Romans and Thessalonians and, and Paul's letter in 1 Peter, right? Do not repay evil for evil. Um, and so, you know, the question for me and what was what has been raised, especially, I don't know if folks know Dr. Diana Francis, who's a Quaker and peace activist. She asks a really, important question, um, and I'll put it in the chat, that I also, you can use this as a way to enter into this conversation with Dr. Wink in these two chapters, but how far can reactive violence be minimized and courage sustained in the face of violent repression? Or as one of my favorite poets, a Somali British poet writes, you know, what does it look like to face the barrel of a gun? Um, what does it mean when you want to go home, but home is this barrel of a gun? And no one would, as she writes, no one would leave home unless you are chased from that space. How do we react in that? And how do we, how do we hold on to our courage to be nonviolent? 
Um, so I invite each of you in the breakout rooms to wrestle with some of these questions that Dr. Wink so eloquently writes about and how this connects to not only naming and unmasking, but he's embarking in my head and in my view, this real work of engaging. What does it mean to engage with the fallen powers to redeem them? What does it mean to turn the other cheek? What does it mean to go the extra mile? What does it mean to strip naked? Um, and in the face of sheer violence, how do we calm our spirits so we are not reacting, right, in a, in a violent way? And so I ask and invite each of you in your breakout rooms to discuss either these prompts or to engage in how you read both of these chapters in light of what we are experiencing in our present moment. In light of what's going on in the Ukraine, I'm in Europe where we're seeing a flood of Ukrainians coming into uh, the Western part of Europe. Um, what does it mean to engage with people who are fleeing from home because they are looking down the barrel of a gun? What does it mean for them to engage with, right, leaving home because of violence that they're experiencing in ecosystems or in other violent conflicts? and wars. And so I am inviting each of you to wrestle with this and engage with this. And we're gonna come back in about 40 minutes um, to have a larger discussion. So I would invite folks to also be prepared to um, raise some really critical issues. Is it possible, possible to be nonviolent in our day and age? I believe it is. I deeply believe it is. And I have profound hope in this. Um, but I need, I need your work and your help to help me remain in that space of hope um, because I'm witnessing right now such profound violence and profound darkness. But each of you are each light in this space. And so as we wrestle with Dr. Wink and, and think about what does it mean to do those three major things that he points out in at least in the sacred text that I believe in, um, and how is it possible? How is it possible in the face of such sheer violence? And so I'm gonna ask um, Bill and others if we can put everyone into the mm -hmm. breakout room. We are, almost everyone is back. So welcome back everyone. Um, welcome back into, our main room. And so we are, I, I'm gonna um, try to manage and facilitate folks who are um, wishing to speak and share based on the conversations that each of you have had in your breakout rooms and really sort of get into what your thoughts are. So would anyone want to lead us in this um, open session with a larger group of what you discussed in your smaller groups or your breakout rooms? One question that we kept asking is, how do we make the situation of violence more real? Like the people, like feeling like the people in Ukraine, how do we, how do we put ourselves in that situation and become deeply involved in the challenge to be nonviolent. Mm. It seems kind of far away, mm. um, but it's it not far feel, away. It, it does uh -huh. feel far away, especially if we're in, in North America, right? Uh, if you're in North America and don't have ties to the Ukraine. And how, how were, Gretchen, how did other members of your group talk about that? Um, you know, having been so far away from the violence and, and not really being connected to it more intimately. I like very um, specific ideas. I mean, very personal. And the thing that struck me was somebody said, well, she'd heard of a grandmother going up to some of the Russian soldiers in Ukraine and saying, my goodness, what would your mother think of this? What would your grandmother think of this? I love that. I think that's a very good um, example. 
And another person said that we need to think of ways how we can band together and um, work together to to protect one another and to be nonviolent. Um, but I think sometimes we become too abstract in our um, way of approaching things and then it becomes unreal. And it needs to be real, for me at least. Absolutely. And that's such a creative thing that that grandmother did. And Debbie, as you say, there was a little old lady who had a placard and went up to soldiers and they actually arrested her, right? And, and witnessing that as well. Debbie, did you want to say more about that? It, it just came to me as, um, as someone else was speaking about women going up to them. Yep. Um, and, and actually, not too long ago, I heard um, a commentator, I think it was a commentator, saying that it gets a little confusing maybe for the Russian soldiers when, because there's so much um, Russian and Ukraine and Ukraine and Russia that the older women are all going to look like they're, um, I forget the word they use, but it was essentially grandma. And that it could get really difficult to to hurt people. So as you were saying, Debbie, is so sort of this this connection between almost intimacy of connection, right? That belongingness that if you yeah. can see your own grandmother in this person who's approaching you, who's Ukrainian, right? That that's actually a creative and transformative way to to, the, to sort of manifest a nonviolent right reality, right? Yeah. Is that oh, I see now part of my belonging is connected to that, right? It's right. harder for me to do violence or enact violence is what I'm hearing from you, Debbie. I don't know if I captured what you were saying. No, um, I think that's it. And I think it's babushka was maybe mm -hmm. the term they used. Um, no, okay. I think you're, that's right. Okay, yeah. Mary, Mary, did you wanna reflect on what you just wrote in the chat a bit? Um, because I'm curious what, what that person in your group suggested, so. So is Max here? Max gave a good explanation of it. So I see Max. Max is here, yes. Max, you're unmuting, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. What did you write in the chat? Let's see. One person in our group suggested that uh, a nonviolent response would be to let all the soldiers know their rights to be conscientious objectors and to not participate in war. That's what I wrote. But Max had a better explanation, I think. Well, I was making the point that um, it was that point, but I was also juxtaposing it against the the idea that oftentimes the adherence to nonviolence when in getting in discussions with uh, people who are more <laughs> militarily inclined are, are, are challenged to offer um, some kind of overarching worldview for, and, uh, for all situations. And a lot of the things that, that nonviolence people talk about are things that would happen in advance of an acute uh, aggression. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's always for us to have to come with a worldview in response. I think when it's very acute, because a lot of our solutions are not about the last minute or or, or dramatic sort of um, event where 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 you are slaughtered um, because you won't engage. Um, it's small things. It can be the things that were said, um, you know, uh, people coming up to tanks. Um, but I don't. I don't expect people to undertake great risks in that situation. That's just my personal view. Um, but there are small things that we can do in our tradition. In, when war breaks out, we emphasize the rights of conscientious objection, and um, and. Uh, and I just happened to mention that I'm working on a text uh, trying to lay out uh, all the rights in, you know, Belarus, Russian Federation, Ukraine. Mm. I'm working on a text from Germany, so it's, uh, listing German rights and also listing 
the positions taken by the, the Court of Human Rights in uh, Council of Human Rights in Europe, because if people can get out, they have a right to get out. They don't have to engage in all three countries, actually. So thank you for that, Max. And um, I appreciate that insight. I'm gonna lift up, um, or did someone else wanna talk before I... So, uh, you know, it was, um, it was really helpful for me to hear what June had said when we were together while you were all in breakout rooms. And I'm gonna put Bill Wiley Kellerman on the spot um, because I think June had mentioned um, that you are familiar with how Dr. Wink started his classrooms or had sort of integrated this in his classroom. Um, so I thought I would ask you, Bill, um, if you could share a little bit about your thoughts on this, because I thought it was a really, a really beautiful insight in this um, that Dr. Wink had mentioned. And if, if you don't remember, don't worry, I know June can back you up here if, if needed. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> well, I can tell my own uh, stories. You know, Walter, would uh, enact these uh, three examples uh, from the Sermon on the Mount as kind of role plays. Uh, and I'll bet there are lots of people here who have you know, witnessed that or even participated in it. He More than once, he asked me to be the one who would strip naked. So I was supposed to come prepared with my bathing suit on under my, my blue jeans. The last time that happened was in a black church chancel, which I hadn't quite foreseen would be the context. Um, but I wanted to credit June here, um, her partnership with um, Walter in their uh, Bible study work. I mean, she brought uh, body movement and dance, uh, all things that would sort of encourage right brain and and. Uh, bodily imagination, and that morphed into a practice that Walter had of, of role-playing uh, scripture texts. And it's my, my belief, and she can correct me if she thinks I'm wrong, but, but I think it was in enacting these three things that the political insight came from doing them bodily, you know, the... It's the, mm. the right cheek, you know, question um, and and which hand and all of that, you know, that had simply to do with let's enact this, how these would work. And that led to the political insight and then back to the uh, embodied action, almost like a little hermeneutical circle of sorts. Uh, but I, I think it was her, her body work that really... Uh, informed not only the the presentation which it was a shtick you know he he he, he did this uh, all over the country with folks where this would be a kind of a light going on to to see these passages enacted as forms of um, uh, nonviolent resistance as opposed to such sort of doormat uh, theology as he sometimes called it uh, but I think the, the roots of it were also in, in the body work. I absolutely love that. And June, did you wanna to speak to that a little bit? Um... Um, no, what, well, I can, I guess, but what I wanted, what Bill had said when Walter would lead a class or maybe the first class that he led that Bill was in is what I told my, our group. When I think, Bill, if I have this right, he asked you the question, what are you willing to die for? Right. Is that what I... <clears throat> That's exactly right. We, uh, we were uh, looking at the pearl of uh, the parable of the pearl of great price and, uh, and the treasure buried in the field. And, uh, and it was clear, you know, what was it that you would sell all, give all? And, and Walter said, let's go around the circle and say what we'd be willing to die for. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't actually remember my answer, but I remember the question. And I don't think you should get out of seminary without being asked that.
And often for me, what you're willing to die for involves your body. It's an embodied response almost, right? There's, it's your body, your mind, your spirit, your soul, all of that, how you feel are all connected. That's embodied in yourself and your being and your being's relationship to others in your community. Um, so when, when that question is asked, I also, it, it triggers me to think about um, not only my own body, what I am willing to die for, but what am I willing to die for with others in this, like in community? And how are my, how is my body in relationship to other bodies part of that, right? Um, and is that is that process transformative or is that process revolutionary, right? Is that process toward a transformative manifestation that that really engages not passively but actively in nonviolence, right? Rather than in a in a passive way, this this almost easy way out, this revolutionary way of of taking and bearing arms towards a different kind of change. Um, I could add just one more thing about Walter. Uh, in the fall of 1971, which was my first year at Union, I had him in the spring semester for New Testament. But in the fall semester, we were arrested together in Washington, D.C. at the Daily Death Toll Project. At that time, there were 300 people a day dying in the in the air war, in, in the US war in, in Vietnam. And so di different cities sent 300 people to die, to do a die-in in front of the White House. So by the time I had him for the New Testament class, um, we'd already been arrested together. And uh, spent, we spent a night in jail in the DC lockup uh, on that occasion. Um, I wasn't with him in jail, but I had contact, but uh, anyway, that that put that also put embodied meat on the on the question, you know, the Bible study question. When we were in Argentina and we were talking to a woman at night, a secret kind of meeting where her husband had disappeared. Uh, and uh, obviously been killed. And they put her in prison because just because she was his wife. And she was describing to us the cell that she was living in. And it was, she said, it's, it was like this table that much, that much space. Yeah. Uh, there was just this little space. And I asked her, I said, uh, how did you do it? How did you, you know, how did you manage to be in that prison, that little space for so many months? And she got up and she she just said, fuerte, fuerte, fuerte. And I thought, here's the body, you know, the body saving her. So um, she was a beautiful woman who was a potter and she gave me a uh, mobile, which I still have, that she made when she got out of prison. And um, so I just wanted to kind of bring in the body here that she was uh, using her body to keep her going. And absolutely. And I appreciate this reminder because our bot often we, we separate our bodies often, right, away from these spaces. But this body embodiment and this embodied action is profoundly important towards all of this and and towards this transformative transformative and creative it's a very creative right space it's rich in that creativity um towards that transform transformative process of nonviolence absolutely so i mean so many of you know i'm here in europe and i'm we're engaging with a number of scholars who are at risk in, in the Europe region and trying to think, especially how we can support our Ukrainian colleagues. So one of my colleagues um, not only experienced witnessing her husband's death during this, but her own children's disappearance and her own experience of torture as she was leaving the Ukraine. 
Um, and wrestling with, you know, we're at a place right now where I'm, I'm engaging with her and her desire is to return to the Ukraine armed and to fight alongside of her fellow Ukrainians um, towards what she believes is the liberation of Ukraine from this violence. And I was mentioning in my group how how I'm wrestling with this, this space of, you know, not necessarily judging her for going back. I am honoring what her decision will be, right? But it is this space of how I wrestle with myself um, uh, and engage with what does it look like for me to engage in nonviolence with her as she desires to engage in picking up arms to fight on behalf of her country? And given her, ex her own experience of violence, her own survivorship of her own torture um, in a short period of time? And what does it mean for our collective network of scholars who are supporting Ukrainian scholars to engage in nonviolent work when someone like her is saying, Fernando, I don't, this is what I feel I need to do in the space of reactivity, right? And reacting to the violence that she experiences that it's been so hard for me to pause, to, to support her in taking that breath to be present deeply with her um, as she wishes to rush back to the Ukraine. And that's what I was sharing in my own sort of wrestling with and my own experience, my past experiences coalescing with these current experiences of what does that mean um, to almost let her go in that space. Um, uh, and I don't know if any of you like it, you know I'm this is this is something I'm seeing her um, in the morning, um, but she's ready to go with arms back to the Ukraine. Um, she keeps on reminding me, Fernando, this is for my husband who was killed, and the children I don't know if I will ever see again. What are you willing to die for, right? You know, and for her, the answer to that question, how I've projected it onto her, is that I'm willing to take up arms, Fernando, and I'm willing to go back to the Ukraine. And it's taken all of this conversation amongst us to be as creative, and as transformative with our ideas, with our commitments to nonviolence. And yet she is still feeling called towards that way. And so I, you know, as I navigate through this, this is what I wrestle with. I had also shared, you know, um, back in the day, witnessing UN workers on an airstrip with these beautifully using their bodies and red flashlights on an airstrip to prevent shelling on the rim of, an, of a mountainside, people shelling, um, people who are running for their lives and fleeing the violence so that safe passage could be made. That to me was a creative act, right? But at the same time, it existed in parallel with a profoundly violent apparatus, military operatives on multiple sides, trying to protect safe passage, right? For a group of people to get to the other side and military operatives shelling or about to shell uh, this airport tarmac. And in that space, these UN workers for a moment in time use their bodies and their red flashlights running around this tarmac, up and down the tarmac for a moment, right? To suspend all that shelling, right? For a moment. And the question still remains, right? What are you willing to die for? Is the same question that I'm, that, is being posed to my colleague who's going back to the Ukraine most likely with her arms. 
And so that's the question I invite each of you. This is what I wrestle with, right? As I witness in this space right now, right? And I was telling June earlier that it could be Chile now, right? It could be the Philippines during martial law now. It could be apartheid South Africa now. Um, it could be Afghanistan now. It could be, F it's Vietnam now. And it's these repetitions that have happened years ago that are still present now. And I still wrestle with how to be nonviolent and how to lean into and live up to what Dr. Wink has consistently taught me, right? Bill, I wish I was in Dr. Wink's New Testament class. Maybe I would be better prepared now, right? <laughs> um, to wrestle with some of these questions and to how do I how do I be transformative for my colleague, right, at this space? So Paul, I appreciate, uh, and, and so Bill, thank you for um, uh, putting the webinar information on um, the Reverend uh, Berrigan's um, uh, collective. Paul, did you wanna um, respond, like speak to what you put into the chat, um, what you've written here? Well, it, it, it struck me from our conversations and the hesitancy that we have partially in projecting ourselves into the midst of a situation that we are not in. We're not in the midst of that right now. But one of the frustrations is that uh, it, it, it takes some good preparation. And um, uh, this struck me with a lot of the work that I, I did at the Nevada test site in preparing people for nonviolent confrontation and uh, going out there. But it struck me uh, remembering back that Bill Anderson and, and others from FOR were involved in the Baltic states tr uh, training in nonviolent confrontation, which seemed, well, that was way too early, but boy, it built up the movement so that when the Berlin Wall fell in 89, people were ready. And some of that training went on in East Germany. I, I had occasion to meet the Lutheran pastor who was temporarily East German's ambassador to the United States. Uh, and he was describing how his church had engaged in that uh, training, which prepared them to take action when the time came. So by the time conflict's broken out, it feels like it's too late. And so this calls for all of us to continue to engage daily and, and, and keep working. Thank you so much for that, Paul. I appreciate that reminder of how, and we all each are called into that space in our own way, right? Is that, that in that daily practice and that everydayness of this, how are we called to do that work, each of us? Um, and so I also want to lift up what Carol, Carol, did you want to um, add to that um, because you brought up Lithuania and then Roy, I want to hear from your, what you've put in the chat as well. But Carol, did you want to uh, say, yes, go Jean, for it? Yeah. Um, people know the name Gene Sharp. Um, he was heavily involved yep. in the work in the Baltic states and Lithuania had adopted a policy of, the, their national policy was nonviolent civilian defense. Um, he told them, you know, there's, there's no point in your arming yourself against the, the Soviet Union because they'll just roll over you. Um, so they, they, um, they adopted the policy. They've now given it up since they became part of NATO um, and um, have arms in Lith Lithuania. But, but still, there is an example of, of um, a, a country that would have been prepared if any country was prepared. Yes, thank you for that, Carol, for reminding us of that. Um, and, and sort of that's also part of the work, right, Carol, is that we can still achieve and engage in that work. 
Um, and remember, I, in our group, we were talking about, there's so many stories that have not been told, have been lost or forgotten, and that we need, how do we, we engage in those stories of nonviolence and be transparent about that across, right, across borders, across communities, um, to consistently remind us of these policies and these actions um, and these interventions. Um, Roy, you, you wrote in the chat as well. Um, and did you wanna say a little bit of, of when you took Dr. Wing's uh, uh, apocalypse course? Well, <clears throat> it was two years earlier than uh, Bill Wiley Kellerman's. And uh, so the Vietnam situation was hot, but not quite that hot. But, but the book, uh, I mean, we read the excerpts from that book, but then he said, go read the book later. So I did. Um, and it really got into, you know, the psalm that says, zeal for your house is eating me up. <laughs> Um, the zeal of martyrdom and the zeal for uh, dramatic self-presentation is when the early church had to learn how to resist. So I, you know, I watched the evening news. I've stopped watching Meet the Press now because I go to a church service that prohibits it, thank, thank the Lord. But uh, it's also, I, you know, we've just gone through the Black Lives Matter thing in this country, and now we have white refugees, and, and the evening news, they're all beautiful little white children, and they're so precious, and the camera lingers on them, and I keep thinking like, you know, the problem is with what seized upon our minds and the media, so I guess I'm I'm just uh, stuck with, with how America is handling this domestically, um, as opposed to dealing with Build Back Better or something that would uh, be a benefit to the American population. So now we have another Wag the Dog show. All right, that's enough. Thank you for that, Roy. And Bill, did you want to say? Yeah, I just, uh, forgive me if I'm talking too much, but I, I didn't want the, this evening to pass without mentioning that the chapter that we looked at, uh, chapter five with uh, Sermon on the Mount material, the first publication of that was by FOR uh, in a little book called Jesus Third Way that was printed with a plain brown cover and circulated to pastors in South Africa, which which Walter and uh, Richard Dietz followed up with doing this as a workshop for laying the groundwork for nonviolent movement in the, in the apartheid struggle. I remember getting that little booklet. It was really uh, quite a treasure. And my, my question is, how do we bring this back, right? How do we engage with this kind of work even more so during these times? Um, how do we amplify that little book um, in spaces that are not only just theologically driven, right? In spaces that, that I'm in spaces where that book is not even known or understood or heard, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, you, know, my, you know, my question consistently is I engage with folks who are not familiar with this literature, this landscape, um, how do we introduce that into those spaces, right? How do we engage with those spaces? Um, and how each of us in this, in this room, right, um, continue to do that work and get beyond the borders that we are in, um, beyond the disciplinary boundaries that we are part of, um, and, and extend beyond that, right? This is part of that work. And, and it may help to mitigate what Roy was talking about, that this, the, the space of the glorification and that narrative of glorification um, that gets reinforced and amplified can be mitigated if we engage in this, this long history of nonviolent activism and engagement, of engaging with the powers in a more creative and transformative way. 
Um, it's remembering how we tell our stories, how we engage with our narratives, how we learn and remember our ancestors, how we are guided by them and use our bodies, as June says, creatively, right? Creatively to be profoundly present in the here and now, but based on traditions of people who have been, right? Engaged in nonviolent work, who have really done the work of enacting, enacting what Dr. Wink has written in these chapters. Um, and so when we are thinking through these, and I know we are running out of time, um, I invite each of you into the space of your divine vocation as we remember, right? Um, as we began, remember, and we started reading the first chapters of this book, Dr. Wink invites us into that space of divine vocation. What are each of you called in this space to do? As you've read, we're now you know, well into the middle part of the book. And as we emerge into even more engagement with the powers as, as we go into the next um, two chapters, what is our actions now? What are our actions now with our bodies? Because June is going to consistently remind us of that. And how are we present with our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our souls, and our integrated and whole self? How are we? How are we engaging in this nonviolence work? Right? Not to be passive, but to be active in that engagement, right? In that deep engagement. And so I am going to um, invite each of you into that space of discernment and reflection as we enter into our next book club next month. And I'm gonna now hand it off to Ethan to just speak about what he put in the chat. Um, and then um, I will end with a prayer. Oh, it's just to say, I, I mentioned earlier that I would put into the chat a link for next Friday's program. And uh, I see that Anthony has also put in the chat a link for the um, e-news that we sent out uh, today, which announces uh, very importantly, and we really, uh, with this extraordinary group of this community of folks who have such deep relationships to movement building at so many levels, including through FOR, but much far beyond, we are uh, have just released uh, the, the Search for a uh, search process for our next um, permanent executive director. And if you know someone, if you are someone, if you uh, identify someone who would be a wonderful candidate to join our uh, team at FOR, we really warmly invite that. So um, click on that link, learn more, or contact uh, us directly to ask ask more, and we'll be uh, happy to to do that. But that also provides information about this coming Monday's April 4th King and Breaking Silence event. And we hope you'll join us on Monday. Anthony, do you have anything you wanted to add separately about some other emails you sent, Anthony? No? No, okay. I'm grateful for each of you. And uh, just to say it's a privilege to serve with Ethan in this interim co-executive director role at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, but we're both very committed to finding our next executive director and we would welcome your support and uh, are just deeply grateful for all each of you are doing in the spirit of June Keener Wink and Walter Wink and the Fellowship of Reconciliation to build the beloved community together. And Fernando can't thank you enough for your leadership. Thank you. Um, for what it's worth, we will try. If you, It's 2.30 in the morning for, for uh, Fernando right now, so we're going to let him go. But I think Anthony can stay. We can keep this window open. If people want to talk for a little longer, that's fine. I'm, the next meeting is April, which is we have two meetings left. The next one will be Thursday, April 28th. And we will be, of course, reminding you of that. But we look forward to having you all back. And thank you for such a vibrant discussion. As I said, thank you, Fernando. I think you want to end us with a prayer, but uh, we understand you you need to get to bed. But for if people want to continue to convert conversing here, please feel free. And, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in a month's time. Thank you again. Over to you, friend. So I just wanted to close with a prayer. This is actually a prayer that was given to me by my colleague who's actually returning, who will most likely return back to the Ukraine. 
And so she gave me this, this prayer from the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Dear God, and I'm gonna light a candle as we do this prayer um, and as I was instructed by her. So dear God, great spirit, I come here to light a candle. I have no expertise in prayer. Even my candle burns somewhat restlessly, sometimes brightly, but sometimes rather dim. Dear God, my life is also often restless. Please help me find peace. Lighten, lighten up my life and enable me to choose what is right. Show your kindness to all who are dear to me and send your Holy Spirit to guard them. Dear God, I cannot stay very long. Please allow my candle to be a sign of my good intention. May you be a light in my life and enable me to be a light to everyone around me. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone for being present today. Um, I will stay on a little longer if people wish to stay. Blessings to everyone on Ramadan as we begin Ramadan tomorrow. Um, and we hold you in peace with deep love and with deep light. Good night, everyone. Take care. Take care.